Okay, so this little part right here is kind of boring, but it will help you fill in a whole column on your hormone spreadsheet. So this chemical class of hormone column, um, most of that will be able, you'll be able to fill it in um, right after we finish this part. Okay, so we know what makes you categorized as a hormone, and it's not your chemistry, it's your traveling mechanism. It's that you're released by a cell, picked up by the bloodstream, travel through the bloodstream to your target cell. But um, now we have to consider the chemistry of the hormone. And I know some of you guys just are chemistry haters, but um, this just allows you to predict something about the physiology. So the chemistry of the hormone matters, especially lipid soluble versus water soluble hormones, because the chemistry of the hormone will determine where you can predict to, for instance, find the receptor on the target cell. So for instance, if your target cell, um, if you were lipid soluble, um, if you were lipid soluble or lipophilic, um, your receptor could be on the cell membrane, but it also could be inside the cell because the cell membrane is lipid. If you're water soluble, then your, um, your receptor better be on the cell surface. Okay, so that matters. And then the other thing that matters is um, if you are, come here. Okay, so um, it will impact whether you need an escort in the blood bloodstream. Sorry, get back in there. Okay, so if you are a lipid soluble chemical messenger, if you are released by your secretory cell and your target cell is like way over on the other side of the body, um, it's really hard for a lipid soluble um, chemical messenger, whether it's a hormone or anything else, to get from point A to point B without getting distracted. So a lot of times somebody has to hold its hand and that somebody, your textbook calls carrier proteins, but I don't like to use that term, so I will call it a transport protein. I like to call it an escort protein because it sounds kind of saucy. So what happens is imagine that your hormone is a toddler and you want to release them f at the back part of the target parking lot and ask them to meet you by the front door. Well, we would never do that, right? Because you won't see them again. They will get completely distracted. Um, so what happens is they need an escort to go from point A to point B. And then if, for instance, you were dropping them off to grandma or dad or brother or sister, you let them go there. Okay, so when you have a lipid soluble chemical messenger, because they are so lipid soluble and the capillaries are lipid soluble and all cells have lipid membranes, um, you better give them an escort. So these escort proteins are for lipid soluble chemical messengers, including hormones. Okay, the other thing is that a water soluble chemical messenger, um, water soluble chemical messengers don't tend to last as long in the body. They have a, a shorter half-life and so you have to make them more frequently and lipid soluble ones have a longer half-life. The other thing of course is this picture is showing and it won't surprise you after doing the cell um, membrane transport notes that a lipid soluble chemical messenger oh, stop doing that can be secreted by diffusion, right? But a lipid, uh, water-soluble chemical messenger, especially like a large peptide, it may have to be secreted by exocytosis, especially if it gets really big. So if, for instance, this was um, a pancreatic beta cell that makes and secretes insulin, the mechanism of secretion, insulin's a peptide or protein, um, secreted by exocytosis, for instance. Okay, um, now let's look at the categories of hormones that exist. Now, when you're going to start running into hormones um, and the spelling of the hormone will matter because the spelling will tell you something about the chemistry. And a mean hormone, okay, a mean hormone, here's some right here, um, is, uh, uses the, an amino acid as a basis and here's tyrosine, it's one of the 20 amino acids and you can make small, ty small changes in tyrosine and end up getting three hormones from it. And these are also sometimes neurotransmitters by making three small changes, okay? So amine hormones, um, first off, anything that ends in I-N-E, okay, 
is telling you in the name that it's an amine hormone, but it means you also have to spell it correctly because dopamine is pronounced dopamine even here in the United States. But norepinephrine is how we pronounce it here in the U.S. Other places pronounce it norepinephrine, which is a little more helpful in the context. Same thing with epinephrine, okay? Epinephrine is how we pronounce it, but it's an I-N-E. Why the heck do you care? Because that tells you it's chemistry. So hormones that end in I-N-E are generally amine hormones. Do you think every single amine hormone was named that way? No, um, sorry. Um, but if it ends in I-N-E, it is an amine, but not all amines end in I-N-E, although you don't learn any that don't end in I-N-E. These are relatively small, meaning if I wanted to, I could count all of those um, atoms. And they're usually stored until they're secreted. So if you have a water-soluble something, you can usually store it. Um, and some examples, um, there are um, these three, which are your water-soluble amines, but then you also have a separate category of amines called the lipid-soluble amines. Okay, so the water-soluble amines are the three that you're seeing right here. Dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Okay, these are all derivatives of the amino acid tyrosine. Okay, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Okay, so those on your sheet would be water-soluble amines. Okay, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Um, the lipid-soluble amines are the two biggie hormones from the thyroid gland. Thyroid actually secretes three, and the third one is a totally different chemistry. And they are called T3 and T4. I don't expect you to spell these yet. Just listen to the names and see what you can get from the names. Because for me, by the way, you have to know the hormone released, its long name, and its abbreviation. Why? Because the long name has tons of information in it that the abbreviation does not. So let's listen to the name of these three, these two hormones. T3. T3 is tri, as in three. Iodo, as in iodine, three iodines. Thyro, as in where it comes from. Nene, I-N-E. Okay. Tri, iodo, thyro, nene. Okay, so that gives you tons of information. And it is a lipid soluble amine. Okay, and then T4 is its buddy, tetra, as in four, iodo, thyro, nene. Okay, tetra, iodo, thyronine, four iodines to make it from the thyroid, and it's an amine. So that's a hell of a lot more information than T4. Okay, now, when you get into clinical situations, T4 will be on the sheet, but when you're talking to a patient, they won't have any idea what the hell T4 means unless you tell them, okay? Um, so both of these require iodine for synthesis. I'll bet you can figure out how many. And the receptor for these two is generally intracellular because they're lipid soluble, okay? So now I've got two possibilities for um, filling in my um, hormone spreadsheet. In this, the chemical class of hormone, there is a possibility of a lipid-soluble amine. Notice I started you out because this will be T3, triiodothyronine, T4, tetraiodothyronine. Those are lipid-soluble amines. Um, there's also an alternate name for one of them. Um, it will be a lipid-soluble amine or it will be a water-soluble amine or there's two other possibilities that we'll learn right now. Okay. Now, the other possibility for um, a hormone, and actually the most common possibility, if you can't remember what chemist, chemical class a hormone is, guess this one. These are peptides or proteins, which you know are strings of amino acids stuck together by peptide bonds. Um, they can get long and folded, and then they're more likely to be called a protein. If they're shorter and not as, uh, as folded, they're more likely to be called a peptide. For me, just smash peptides and proteins together. So um, the vast majority of hormones fall into this category. If you ever can't remember, guess peptide, because it's more likely to be right than anything else. And what do you think? Um, peptides are water soluble or lipid soluble. They're relatively large, hard to get through the cell membrane. They are water soluble. And that means where would their receptors be on their target cell? cell membrane or intracellular receptors? 
has to be on the cell membrane because this is water soluble, good. And then where would they have been made in the secretory cell? Well, if they're made for exocytosis, they would have been made on the ribosomes, probably on the rough ER because that's where you package stuff from. So rough ER, and then remember your Golgi apparatus, um, cleaves and packages, and then you release them usually by exocytosis because they're usually a little too big to release by any other mechanism. Now, any hormone that ends in IN is a peptide, which is why you need to know that epinephrine, even though it's pronounced that way, does not end in IN. Any hormone that ends in IN is a peptide hormone, although not all peptides do end in IN. For instance, insulin, that's a peptide, but glucagon is too, because it didn't get the message, okay? So if it ends in IN, it is a peptide, but not all peptides end in IN. We've got somatostatin, and we've got um, oxytocin, and insulin, and those are all peptides, and that's all well and good. So how about which ones? Okay, so all of the hypothalamus hormones that you learn, so all seven of these are all peptides, okay, meaning peptide slash protein. Um, oh, sorry, all, all the hypothalamus hormones except dopamine, which comes from the hypothalamus and tells you what it is. All six of the anterior pituitary hormones that you learn are peptides, okay? Um, both of the posterior pituitary hormones, um, ADH, antidiuretic hormone, and oxytocin, which does end the right way, which is great. Your pancreatic hormones, insulin, thanks for ending the right way, somatostatin, thanks for ending the right way, and glucagon, <laughs> um, those are all peptides. Parathyroid hormone, PTH, um, and then um, I say most hormones from the anterior pituitary, but it's all that you learn from the anterior pituitary. And then there are other organs. We don't learn these hormones specifically in this set of notes. Sometimes we lay, add them in later in this uh, semester. But um, other organs like the heart, the thymus, most of your digest digestive tract hormones like ghrelin, those um, are all peptides as well. So most hormones are peptides. Um, okay, and then last but not least, our steroid hormones. Okay, so let us um, introduce you to what steroid really means. Um, so what steroid really means is that these are lipid-soluble hormones and they are all derived from cholesterol, okay? So you have cholesterol in every single one of your cell membranes, and cholesterol is something that you actually need, even though there's too much dietary cholesterol, but we're talking about cholesterol primarily that you produce here. Um, these are lipid-soluble, they're derived from cholesterol, and they're not really possible to store very well because they're lipid-soluble. So yeah, it's hard to store things that are lipid-soluble. So you make them, release them, make them, release them. So when they are made, they will diffuse directly through the cell membrane of the secretory cell, and then they'll usually um, go directly through the cell membrane and bind usually to intracellular receptors on their target cell. And the primary places that release them, and we're going to go through each of these as we go through the organs. I'm just trying to give you an intro. Everything from the adrenal cortex that you learn is a steroid. Okay, um, including aldosterone, cortisol, corticosterone. These are all these guys right here. And um, yeah, aldosterone. Um, and then the other steroids that are really important to us are what we call the gonadal steroids. And the gonadal steroids are steroids that mostly come from the gonads. And in this figure, we'll look at this figure multiple times. And by the way, you don't have to be able to draw it. You just have to have the big picture that these three, which are green, are sex neutral. You have approximately the same amount in both sexes. Um, those come from the adrenal cortex. These that are in pink, boop, 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 and this, these are in higher proportions in females than males, okay? And then... These right here, one, two, three, four, blue, those are in higher proportion in the male sex, okay? And these are collectively right here called the estrogens. These are collectively called the androgens, and this one is progesterone off by itself. So when you get to your hormone spreadsheet and you are at the adrenal cortex, see, all of those are steroids, right? 
when you are at the gonads, the vast majority of the ones that come from the gonads are going to be steroids and the same thing with the ovaries. Not every single one, but all of them, almost all of them. This figure, by the way, is the same thing that you're looking at here. I'm not asking you to memorize this one at all. I just don't know if you guys remember that cholesterol is this ring structure. And these guys right here, DHEA, androstenedione, testosterone. These are all the androgens. Here's the estrogens. Here is the, oops, I forgot to circle that one. These are the sex neutral ones. And then there's progesterone, which is also gonadal, uh, gonadal um, hormone in a higher proportion in females. Okay, so let's see, did we do it all? All right, so um, assignment. As you are going through these notes, I've tried, tried to give you um, an indication of when you should go fill things out in your table. So um, if I were you, I would fill in the column titled chemical class of hormone on your endocrine table. You can do this table digitally or you can do it handwritten, but make sure you've got an eraser because you're going to make mistakes as you go through because that's part of the learning process. Again, there are four possible hand answers for each hormone. Each hormone could either be a water soluble amine, a lipid soluble amine, a peptide, or a steroid. Okay, those are the possible answers. And if you don't get it all from the beginning, remember that we are going to go through each of the hormones as we go through the organs. Okay, so last tidbit about chemical class of hormones is just how these hormones travel in the blood. Um, most hormones travel free in the bloodstream like you're seeing here, just like free in the bloodstream. But some lipid soluble hormones need an escort like these guys steroid and thyroid hormones do. And they actually have to have this escort protein, which they call a carrier protein, but I like escort or chaperone if you want to be a little less saucy about it. Um, and those um, escort proteins are usually made by the liver. So the liver is intimately related to all things endocrine, especially if it's lipid soluble stuff. But the other important thing is that um, this escort protein has to know when to hold the hand but it also has to know when to let go because what the escort protein kind of does is makes the, the hormone temporarily less lipid soluble. So it stays in the bloodstream, but then remember it's target cell. Um, the receptor is generally into intracellular, so you're gonna have to let it go then. So if your escort protein is either um, not picking it up or not letting it go, it can generate what looks like a hormone problem. Okay, we'll stop there.